Mic check. Okay, Irashamase, welcome uh, from Kyoto, Japan, for our discussion entitled Leave No One Behind the Importance of Data in Development. If you're here, um, you're in for a treat. We have some dynamic panelists here with us in person. And in line with the theme of today's discussion of not leaving anyone behind, we have those who will be joining us virtually. Before we get into it and before I kind of get into a long monologue here, I want to invite my esteemed colleague and friend, Dr. Danielle Smith of Syracuse University to open us with some opening remarks. Dr. Smith. Thank you, Yusuf. Greetings to the session's organizers, the presenters, the audience here in person and virtually, and to all those attending the UNIGF in Kyoto. I am truly honored to welcome you to this session, and I would also like to thank the people of Japan for your very warm hospitality. I'm very thankful for the leadership of Wisdom Donker and Kweku Antwi at Africa Open Data and Internet Research Foundation who are joining us virtually. Their tremendous support in planning this session has been instrumental. As we know, there are many ongoing data initiatives around the world. Implementing data initiatives in Africa can play a significant role in accelerating progress towards achieving the sustainable development goals on the continent. Africa faces a unique set of challenges and opportunities, and leveraging these technologies can help address key issues and support sustainable development. However, it is also important to address challenges such as data privacy, cybersecurity, infrastructure development, and ensuring that these technologies benefit all segments of society, including those who are the most vulnerable. In addition, governments, the private and public sectors, and civil society organizations must work together to create supportive systems for the implementation of these diverse initiatives. By effectively using such technologies, African governments can lessen existing challenges and continue to create more sustainable, inclusive, just, and prosperous futures for their citizens. The session presenters are experts in this area and can help us understand these initiatives and broader global trends. It is particularly important to learn about developments on the ground and from experts who are in the field. Thank you again for joining us and we look forward to, to an informative session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, as I said, we're going to get right into this discussion, and for those joining us in person and virtually, we've decided to split this conversation into two main components. The first component is addressing gaps, encouraging data use, and encouraging strengthening the data ecosystems. The first set of conversations will be situated in that piece here. And then the second component is leveraging technology and community networks to make sure that everyone gets connected. It's essential that we don't just theoretically have a conversation about ensuring access to data, leveraging data, but making sure that everyone is included and that no one is left behind. As I said, we have an amazing set of panelists here with us in person and online, and we're going to get right to it. So to kind of begin, I want to start with you. Um, let's see, Victor Ohuguru. Uh, forgive me and correct me uh, in, in your um, presentation for me not pronouncing your name correctly, who's a senior Africa regional manager at the UN Foundation for Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. I want to begin with you, if you can just please give us uh, a minute or two of opening remarks and let us hear how you're doing this work at the UN. We don't want to leave you behind. So let's look. Well, wh while we while we get Victor, let's let's go to Kwaku. Kwaku Antwi is a leader with this collective here from the African Open Data and Internet Research Foundation. Kwaku has been, uh, as Dr. Smith mentioned, an important uh, leader in this conversation and someone who has helped to drive the conversation. Kwaku, if you could please introduce us to yourself and 
please inform us as to how the AODERP is, is leading the way and making sure that not just that communities have access to open data, but what are the tools that are necessary to accelerate the, the SDGs? Thank you, Yusuf, and hello to everybody. Uh, my name is Kweku Enchi from the African Open Data and Internet Research Foundation. Um, I'm in charge of the community outreach and projects and also in organizing events around open data initiatives um, across Africa through our network. Um, I think one of the most important um, aspects we recognize in our current dispensation in this digital world is being informed or being part of what is um, going on in our society. Um, data, as they say, is the new oil which is um, driving our economies. And being able to access data and utilizing data is also very important for all of us. I mean, as we speak now, there's a lot of information ongoing as we are participating in this year's IGF in Kyoto. And uh, when we talk about data and open data, we talk about data which is available in formats which are easily accessible on um, portals or repositories which do not require enormous and um, mitigating circumstances for you to not be able to access that data. Um, open data, we can say, is one of the biggest drivers of open communities and also being able for people all across the world and in communities to be able to access information. Um, one beautiful aspect about open data is that it encourages not just the private sector, government, and all other sectors to be able to share their data, to be able to have people utilize this data for purposes, and where we're able to strengthen ourselves and also enforce where there are data gaps in which we can be able to share and also improve our societies. Well, in accessing this data, we all know that we're in a digital world now, and data is not just on hard copies in some um, libraries or some safe havens or safes where it is. And you need to be able to have the other data, which is internet connectivity, to be able to access this data. And that's where we also come in, in which we are bridging this divide in terms of connectivity and setting up um, community networks and also helping the communities themselves to have the skills to set up a network, to have the skills to be able to utilize this data, interpreting and understanding the data for themselves, and also being able to transmit the data in formats which are usable, acceptable, and also safe for them. So those are my opening remarks, and um, I leave the floor for the rest of the panel. Thank you, Kwaku. I want to jump to my colleague at Syracuse University, Dr. Lee McKnight. Uh, Lee, you know, it, it's as Kwaku said, data is gold. Uh, it is valuable. Many companies are in an AI race right now where they're leveraging data in ways that are helping to accelerate their economic opportunities. But we've done work in the past around ensuring that not, not just that we ensure that data is accessible, but that we preserve people's rights. Can you talk about the relationship between expanding access and internet connectivity with ensuring that that data is governed properly and appropriately, and can you lead us into some solutions onto how you manifest that in your work? Thanks, Yusuf, and thank you all for being here virtually or in person and engaging in this uh, very important conversation. Um, I want to recall back to 2008, uh, uh, IGF in Hyderabad, uh, perhaps somewhere here, uh, there or there at that time, when the uh, coalition on dynamic coalition on internet rights and coalition on internet principles agreed that it didn't make sense to have co two coalitions on rights and principles, but there really should just be one. Going forward, it was founded the following year. Since then, there's been a charter on internet rights and principles created. Following that, over work with you, we've taken that work forward on embedding in the virtual space uh, rights and principles for governance, for whether it's a, for, for data rights, for privacy, for security. That now has been extended with your, closely with you, Yusuf, to smart cities and communities. 
any village, any community can be a smart community, can have embedded in its governance framework rights and principles, including for data rights. Uh, so that's going forward to the present, where now with the work also with the Africa Open Data and Internet uh, Research Foundation on bringing connectivity to communities anywhere in the world, we can help ensure that the, the rights and privileges to citizens' data are, chose are determined by those people who live there, and they're not, not automatically harvested by external forces without the consent of the community. Thank you. I think along those lines, you know, we, have, we have the honorable, can we just say this again, honorable, uh, Samuel Narti George, a member of parliament from Ghana here with us. And Dr. McKnight explicitly mentioned the importance of ensuring nothing about us without us, in essence, that we should not be accessing and determining governance principles around data without ensuring that the communities who are directly impacted have not just a voice but are driving the conversation. Can you talk a bit about the role that you as a member of parliament can play in ensuring that data governance is inclusive of the voices of your constituents and the work that Ghana is doing to accelerate access to data and making sure that the data ecosystems are secure um, and respecting your citizens' rights? All right, thank you very much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, depending on what part of the world you are in. I, I believe that the conversation about doing this for everyone, inclusive of everyone, is extremely critical. And for me, it highlights a, a major disconnect because we have this conversation about the West leaving Africa but we don't discuss the disconnects inside of our own countries in Africa between our capital cities and the rural communities that are underserved or unserved. Because governments and parliament has to take decision on the basis of data that's generated. A lot of this data is generated from e-government portals and services that people access online. Now the question you need to ask yourself is the connectivity in Accra, for example, is different from the connectivity in a rural community in the northern part of Ghana. And so that data, that parliament or the Ministry of Finance is going to be using to advise parliament in terms of resource allocation is going to be skewed based on the data, that the source of that data, which is skewed towards the urban areas where people have higher spending power and are able to buy data because we joke about it, but possibly what I spend on data in a week is actually a whole family up north, uh, the whole subsistence of that family of six people for a whole month. And so the question is, if data is not as cheap and accessible and platforms are not accessible, people are not contributing to the data pool. And so we need to look at the disconnect and the digital gaps inside of our own countries on, on the African continent between our urban areas and underserved areas. And that's where the community networks come in. And that's where you have um, in Ghana, for example, our Universal Access Fund, GIFEC, trying to close that gap and do last mile connectivity. But then I keep saying that we, we have a lot of conversations and on these platforms about connectivity, bridging the connection, the connectivity gap, but we're not talking about whether that connectivity we're bridging is actually accessible uh, or affordable. Because it's one thing to bring a network into a community, it's another thing determining if it's at a price that the, 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 the individuals in that community can hook up to the service. Because if you don't get the data from the people in the underserved area, we will continue to make decisions in parliaments, in capital cities that are skewed away from the needs of the people on the ground. And so that's where the real disconnect is. And that's the real quagmire that I think we need to figure out how do we get, because government is increasingly making its decisions on the back of data sets that are generated by people's, by, by digital footprints of citizens. But if in our countries we have citizens who do not have a digital footprint because they don't have access to internet, or even when you bring internet at very economically affordable prices, the cost of smartphones is inhibitive because as, 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 as there are various segments to connection. It's the connectivity itself, then the cost of the connectivity, and then access to that connectivity on a device. 
And so for me, I'm beginning to champion a case of saying that just like in pharmaceuticals, where you have generic drugs, because the big pharma, big pharma has made profit from its uh, intellectual property. And so a drug that's produced by Bayer or, or Pfizer could cost about $100 for a sachet. But I could get that same drug by an Indian generic maker, same efficacy, but not the same brand name for five dollars. And we're doing that in pharmaceuticals. We should begin to do the same thing in technology, where the likes of Apple and Samsung have made a lot of money off their intellectual property. We should begin to have generic devices that are going to be cheaper, that are assembled on the African continent, and then would make it easier for people to have digital footprints. Because a citizen without a digital footprint cannot be part of the data sets that government is using to take decisions for them. As I said, honorable. Um, Dr. Uzma Alam here from Science for Africa Foundation joining us virtually. Dr. Uzma, really appreciate you being here. As a public health practitioner, data is key to understanding how we can solve, especially in context of the pandemic that we've left, are kind of leaving, or may still be in, depending on where in the world you might be, data has been tremendous in both deploying public health resources and understanding how we are going to be efficient in ensuring everyone is taken care of. Can you please share with us a bit about what you're doing at Science for Africa Foundation and the role that data will play from a public health perspective? Thank you for that, and uh, greetings everybody from Nairobi, Kenya, and you know, a big, a big thank you for the organizing event. It's been really exciting for me to, you know, hear the, the panelists who came before me because where we are, like where the Science for Africa Foundation plugs in, we are, you know, towards uh, the end of we would be benefiting from what some of the panelists have, have started doing, especially in, in health. So the Science for Africa Foundation, just, you know, for context, is a pan-African organization where we fund research and innovation across Africa, but we also uh, work with <coughs> designing programs and providing, you know, ecosystem strengthening. And within that, we have a science policy engagement portfolio. And that you pointed out to, you know, looks at how can we drive value from uh, African, African generated data and how do we actually simulate what the Honorable uh, mem Member of Parliament just mentioned? How do we ensure that Africa is responsible for, you know, generating its own data, but also how do we govern that? And I think, you know, critical issues and threads of this have come up, but something I just would like to highlight for, for context of this conversation is, you know, when we, I've been hearing the word data, 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 but I think within data, what, you know, our work's pointing to and what, uh, you know, what I think the discourse should be focused of or, or, you know, to even answer your question directly, what will take us from data to impact is really those nuances and within data. And what do I mean by that, right? So yes, there there is data, but there is this need for, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion in data. So we've already talked about, you know, West driven data, a footstep, you know, footprint that doesn't match the African content. But within that, you know, we have our our women, let's let's not forget them a big piece when it comes to comes to health and, and you know, especially the next pandemics, right? And within that, there's also this whole uh, <clears throat> concept within Africa that we really need to you know, if, if we need to get from data to preventing the next pandemic, like you said, so or even drive impact is this piece around governance, right? So Africa, yes, needs to generate its own data and we need to be responsible for governing it. But there's this piece that, you know, we need to appreciate that data is obviously cross cutting, right? Whether it's health, whether it's agriculture, whether it's finance and stuff. And what some of our work has been pointed to, especially when we start looking at governance around uh, data policies in Africa, you know, they're housed very specifically within, uh, for example, majority of the ICT, you know, or equivalent ministries of health, right? I mean, ministries of ICT. And that obviously has implications for how somebody in health can access that data, even at a local level, even within governments, right? And there is this, this fine balance of what, you know, uh, what the mission of one is and you know what the mission of the other is. I think, you know, my rallying call to for this conversation and you know, 
to get from data to impact would be yes, you know, we need equitable partnerships, we need, you know, locally generated data, and that includes devices for it. But we also need to be very careful of how we govern, that we do not start governing in silos, that, you know, when the data exists, we can't even have access to it, even at a very high level. So I think I'll stop at that and hand back to you, sir. Thank you. Wow. Um, I think we still have Victor uh, Ohurugu on the on the line. Victor, please, if I've, again, mispronounced your name, I am a stickler for saying people's name right. So please let me know if that's the case. Uh, but if you can please talk to us about your work at the UN and, and in particular how uh, the UN is trying to bridge the gap between all of the respective conversations we've had here. We have the academia here, we have governments here, we have civil society here and the UN plays an important role as a convener. What are, what are you doing at the UN, and, and how do you see these issues of data governance, particularly for Africa, manifesting themselves in ways that help to facilitate the sustainable development goals? Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Can you yes, hear me? Yes, we, we, we can hear you. Yeah, I thank you. I'm Victor, Victor Horago. Um, yeah, so uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, of course, good evening for some of you in some other parts of the world. Um, I'm Victor Horagu. Uh, I work with the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, uh, which is, you know, uh, warehoused within the UN Foundation. Uh, the UN Foundation is where we are currently, you know, uh, seated. Uh, the Global Partnership is a growing network of over 600 participants uh, or partners, which include state actors and non-state actors. Uh, these non-state actors, uh, civil society organizations, the private sector, research academic institutions, you know, uh, developer, you know, communities across, you know, the world. And these actors are set across about 35 countries uh, in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. And we're all collaborating together to accelerate progress on sustainable development and on the SDGs particularly, but through better data. Um, so together with our set of partners, we have looked at uh, and we're collaborating across three key systemic issues that have been identified together with our partners. And one particular set of that issue focuses on timely data. Uh, we do believe and we have seen across the world that governments particularly need data on a very timely uh, basis to making decisions and enabling the various policy instruments that they do put together. But these governments are not having that, you know, uh, quick access to information, to data. And so we're helping governments to make use of both non-traditional, you know, uh, data forms and technologies that could help them have, you know, the best and quickest access uh, to this data. We also look at the issues of inclusive data, where we want to see marginalized groups you know, have more agency in the data value chain. People who, you know, have been left out uh, with ensuring that governments and all other actors within the data value chain can focus on this set of people. And the third component of our program looks at accountable data governance. You know, we're trying to unlock the opportunities of data for all, uh, making sure that data is well governed, you know, by certain standard principles. And so what do we do in a particular country? My role covers Africa pretty much, where we have seen that there is a huge issue around capacity, uh, just understanding what data is across different levels, both in the political and technical space, understanding what type of data is needed, you know, to drive certain policy, you know, issues, understanding how to even use that data in itself, uh, is a major issue. And so we have various programs that focuses on building capacity uh, in terms of, you know, understanding what type of data is needed, where to source that data, how that data can be used. And we're working with both, you know, uh, all the actors within the value chain, particularly governments, but ensuring that we can strengthen, you know, connection and partnership between the private sector and government uh, to drive the agenda of data. You know, we want to see how that data is given its prominence within the political space, particularly. Uh, it would, you know, of course, not be too surprising for many of you that a lot of government actors, you know, make decisions that are not data driven. You know, of course, politicians, you know, are pretty much focused on what, you know, will get them into the place that they need to be. But oftentimes, very many of them do not reckon with data. So, how do we push the political profile of data? within governments, but also working with the technical you know, level guys to ensure that they have access to the right data sets 
that they need uh, to support government in their various decisions and policy making process. Uh, and so um, I will look forward to, you know, how that, you know, we could have a broad based conversation that bring all of the actors together and we could work, with, you know, with all of you to address, you know, the issue of access, availability and the use of this particular data uh, for policy and decision making within the continent. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you for correcting me in the pronunciation of your name. Uh, you know, as we said, this conversation will be split into two. Um, I want to advise those who are joining us virtually that our colleague, uh, Lahari Chowdhury, will be able to uh, collect your questions. If you are joining us virtually and you have any questions, Lahari Chowdhury will be able to collect your questions in chat. That way we can make sure that we are including everyone in this conversation. So as, as I said, the first component of this conversation has kind of been addressed. We've, we've talked with our dynamic panelists here. Um, and I want to jump to, and I think actually uh, Victor helped us really transition into the second uh, component, the second piece of a conversation, which is leveraging technology and community networks to make sure that everyone, um, making sure data gets to everyone. You know, uh, Dr. McKnight, I'll start with you first. Um, I want I don't want to assume we have we're all operating on the same set of understanding of what community networks are and how we can leverage technology to both advance community networks and make sure that data gets to everyone. So can you do two things for me? Um, can you first explain what are community networks? How do we ensure that it can be utilized as a mechanism to ensure access to data for everyone? And then talk a bit about um, some of the work that you're doing around this particular set of questions. Sure, thank you so much, Yusuf. Uh, so first, uh, we can uh, think about community networks, uh, and I would give a lot of big credit to the Internet Society for all of its advocacy and work over many years in encouraging uh, people to think not just of uh, telecommunications or national level networks, but the fact that people can, in fact, build and create their own local networks. Um, and that, so that work has been ongoing for some time. Um, I, I wanted to bring in here one example, maybe as this transition from the first part of the conversation to the second, and I'm I forget her name, I should remember her name, but uh, the mayor of a Chilean community that was previously disconnected until there was a community network during the pandemic. She said, we exist. That's now she's part of the data pool. Yes, that she has to have uh, rights and be protected, but now her community she exists in a way she didn't before. So community networks provide a way to now bring connectivity to people, the 2.5, 2.6 billion people that exist, but they're not counted. They're not included in any way, uh, generally speaking, in our conversations because they cannot reach us uh, digitally. All right, so now how do we go about this today? There's many different technologies available to create community networks, and that great work has been done for some time. We here at, at Syracuse University, working with uh, the Worldwide Innovation Technology Entrepreneurship Club, or YTech, over decades, have developed a packaged small form where it's not enough to have connectivity if you don't have energy, right? You cannot stay connected for very long, uh, your battery life. So having a package that includes both a connectivity solution and, act and is a tiny little mi portable microgrid solar powered, that's been something that we've been evolving and has been uh, deployed into over 20 countries now uh, and is currently uh, in that use in uh, Ghana. Uh, for connecting school children, libraries, and further, as its first deployment was in the Democratic Republic of Congo. So it's possible now, it's not like it's, this is not theory, this is just something that we, you can come see it in the exhibit booth. Uh, otherwise, you could have a more established, a larger community network with established towers and so on, but you don't necessarily need to create any new infrastructure. We talk about being the academic here, infrastructureless networks. So we can have an infrastructureless network that is not just a network, it's also a microgrid that exists, it's, you can go see it. So this is not theory, this is fact, and we can take this, there's 2.6 billion people that need to be connected, they exist, I'll stop there. You know, honorable, um, and thank you for that, Lee, I, I'm, I'm struck with the we exist comment um, that kind of struck a particular core with me. And you know, Ubuntu is a concept 
on the continent of I am because we are, this notion that we are, we have an obligation amongst and with each other. Uh, can you talk a bit about just the way that we go beyond, and I, I thought you put it beautifully, beyond um, connecting people from a very kind of academic or kind of theoretical perspective, but what does that do to demonstrate that we exist? How do we, how do we unlock people's fullest potentials by providing them the access to, this, to, the, to data as well as the internet? Well, um, it literally just transforms the world. It changes the entire economics of that locality. And I'll give you a typical example of something that a project that we're toying with in, in Ghana at the moment. If we were able to connect an unconnected community and then we could send them educational material, a young man who hitherto would have had to go to a city center to learn a trade or go to a master craftsman could actually with a smartphone take models in how to become a bricklayer or a mason or become a skilled laborer. And that gives him an employable skill that puts food on his table. So this ability to run blended learning platforms are critical. COVID taught us a lesson in Ghana where kids who were not connected to the national grid lost a year of school. If we had community networks, we could have, because we, we actually put educational material on the internet and on national TV. But some of these communities had absolutely no connectivity, be it electricity, TV, or internet. And so the kids in those schools have lost a year of their lives, thanks to no fault of theirs. Now, if you're able to connect these communities, you transform the whole ecosystem there because there's someone there who's now going to be able to run a business center. Is going to, his, I mean, it brings a whole new lease of life to the people in there. And so, I mean, most of us in these rooms, even in capital cities, we do a lot more with data on our phones than voice calls. Our lives revolve around data. And, and, and that should just, you can just imagine what happens if you don't have data. The first thing people ask for when they walk into an establishment, especially for all of us who've traveled here, the first thing I did at the airport was not to change money. First thing I did at the airport was to get a data SIM. Because it's the only way I can stay connected. It's the only way I can stay productive. If I don't have data, I'm cut out. And so if we're able to bring people to a place where they're connected, you actually open a whole new specter. You just need to see the excitement in communities that get connected to 3G for the first time from 2G. Because when they're just doing voice, they have absolutely no connection to the internet superhighway. And now the internet is actually where everything happens. The young people who've graduated school in urban areas who are able to make a livelihood by trading on Facebook, being able to sell, uh, they buy things, they, they have a Facebook page or an Instagram page, and they're selling. Now, imagine that there's a young man in a rural community who also has the opportunity to now become the guy who, if you need anything from the major city, he goes to pick it up, puts a little margin on it, and people in that community can actually just deal with him on WhatsApp. It doesn't even have to be on Instagram. He can run a business page on WhatsApp where he advertises his, his wares and he can transact business there. So there is real economic power that exists when you give people connectivity. Because, I mean, many of us take these connections for, for granted. We're, we use them for TikTok and Instagram and, and Snapchat. But the internet has real economic power for people who are in the most difficult positions. And, and that's the power of transformation that we can bring. When we, when we let people realize the transformative positive impact of the internet, either for business or for educational purposes, there's a real life opportunities that can change the whole specter for people. And when people get these skills, it's now a digital world. He can be sitting in that village and doing data processing for a blue chip company in the United States and get paid Forex because he, now he's gotten He's, he's able to lend data processing or lend, lend, lend coding online. Those are all opportunities that hitherto he would have to leave that community and travel to an urban area where he most likely has nobody and 
be exposed to all the vagaries, but you can bring the world into the, the into that into this small device in the hands of that young person, so long as you give them a connectivity. And I think that it's it's something that as governments and as parliaments, we need to begin to prioritize, to identify these communities and begin to reach out to them as a matter of, of course. Because for, 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 for the telcos, most of those communities don't make economic sense for them to go into in the first place. Because they're looking at the numbers, they're looking at the cost of running this, their, their infrastructure. And so when I hear Doc talk about infrastructureless connections, those are the kinds of connectivities that we need. And for the kids who are using those connections in Ghana to access um, educational material, that's material they would never have been able to access. But kids who are gonna write the same end of year exams with them who are in urban areas have access to those same materials. So you have kids going to write the same exams but are completely disadvantaged from the get go. Now, how do they pass and compete with these kids in the urban areas for limited slots in, in public universities? So this, this, this just bridges the gap and, and creates a whole new vista for these young people in, in, in those communities. And that's why it's very imperative that we take this as a very serious point. You know, I, I will be very transparent and say that I am a professed, avowed, and committed Pan-Africanist. Uh, and Kwaku and I have had a number of conversations personally around Pan-Africanism and the role that it plays in both facilitating a brighter future for African descendants across the globe. Um, but Kwaku, if you could talk to us a bit about what open data and community networks can mean for helping to not just facilitate the UN Sustainable Development Goals, for not just unlocking, as the Honorable uh, mentioned, the fullest human potentials of each of us, but also to build a United States of Africa to kind of facilitate for this connected, inclusive continent. Thank you, Yusuf. And um, I think uh, the Honorable Member of Parliament has given us a search and I think Dr. McKnight also spoke about it. Basically, when we talk about open data and also the the infrastructureless factual structure where you're able to access on portals and with technologies and the data. It's important for us just not to think, um, I think Dr. Usman talked about silos, okay? To not think about our domains where we are looking to ignite or digitalize or to push forth for the technologies to apply. And we're just talking about education, okay? But there's, um, there, there is endless possibilities to the innovation of the technologies and the data. So for example, I'll just give a very short example we had this year. This year we did an open data day in which we celebrated open data in Accra. And what we did is that we brought together um, persons from the statistical part to the open data. We brought people back from the private sector in terms of those who use geospatial data technologies, and then we brought the met, um, and we brought the space science technology, and guess what happened? They were talking to people. They were talking to themselves in the room. They were doing very similar jobs, which required a lot of data from um, um, a disaster, from climate to um, uh, economic data to private um, geospatial data for all sorts of purposes. But guess what? They were transforming our communities. And what was there? The connection. What is this connection? Is the connectivity to be able to connect to the internet, to be able to talk to people, to be able to exchange. Today, I'm able to connect to you from where I am in Accra, Ghana, due to internet connectivity. I'm knowledgeable. I have that information. I'm sharing with everybody because I'm connected. I'm connected because we are not. Um, uh, uh, we are all in an open. Um, an environment in which we can share information. And this information is being recorded and it's going to be represented in a portal or at a storage place where everybody can access. And this is the power and transforming nature of internet connectivity and the power of data and information that it brings and the richness to it. In Africa, we have this potential. And yes, we should and we are able to transform our communities with this kind of data and information that we have. Because 
being here and being having that internet backpack in Winneba or in Tamale or in Wa or in Ho, I should not just be able to connect with the school children who are in that community, but I can also con connect across the country. Not only so, but the cloud infrastructure that is available for you to be able to access should you have also interactive capacity in which is not just for education, but also our healthcare facilities, our agricultural facilities, and also all other facilities who are able to connect as we are doing across the continent. And yes, Yusuf, it's important that we recognize our capacities and being able to enhance it in the African context to be able to connect everybody, as you said, Ubuntu. We are all moving together in this forward together and we go ahead with everybody ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Kwaku. Dr. Uzma, um, you and then uh, Victor will be the last two before we open it up for conversation with those of us in the audience. Folks who may have questions online, please do send them in chat and Lahari Chowdhury will make sure to get those questions to us. And for those who are in the room, uh, please, uh, you don't have to run up to the mics, but you're welcome to also join us for questions. Um, Dr. Uzma, the question for you is centered around good health, well-being, gender equality, and um, let's let's leave it with those two issues first. Um, you know, we we we've talked about unlocking and unleashing everyone's potential. We've talked about the way that connectivity can ensure uh, people's fullest potential can be maximized. But from a practical, pragmatic perspective. Um, this can have significant implications on ensuring good health and well-being and gender equality for women and girls. Uh, two of the, s uh, of, of the 17 uh, SDGs addressed there. Could you please lean in a bit about those two topics for us? Because we don't want to make sure that we want, we want to make sure that we are not leaving out an explicit call out for uh, gender equality, for making sure that women and girls are included, uh, as well as good health and well-being. Dr. Uzma. Oh, thank, thank you for that question. I, I love it. It brings up me more excited. So, you know, it's if if we if we pin our our work around those those two pillars you have said, right? And then bring in this piece of connectivity. It's it's actually what everybody has said, right? It's life changing. And it's life changing not only for, for the end users, but in honesty, it's it's gonna be all of us. But what it also does is it uh changes how research and innovation is done within the African context. So that's, you know, very critical with this dialogue is we'd say, we need to drive our research agenda, you know, we need to drive our innovation, but then, you know, as soon as we start saying that, then we need to start thinking how we're going to fund this, right? And the only way we can, you know, ensure that there's, that we take off, not take off the boxes, but, you know, we, we leverage on all these different areas, whether it's gender, whether it's, you know, uh, data, whether, you know, you want to call it connectivity, is through these linkages, right? And the way I would like to look at these linkages or connections is, is through community of practices, right? And just to give you a small example of what this means in, in practice and in, in how it's implemented, right? So we are very focused on when we fund for whether it's research or innovation to fund within this, this hub and spoke model, right? And where you have a lead organization that works with, you know, other organizations around. And these can be, you know, the private sector, the academic sector, the government sector. And when we say lead institutions, you know, the importance for us was like, if we just look at the funding landscape, right? Whether it's for health, whether it's for innovation, whether it's for agriculture, finance or whatever, in Africa, you know, there are pockets of where the funding goes. We know South Africa, is strong, we know Kenya is strong, uh, we know some of the North African countries are strong, but Africa is huge and there's capacity across our 54 member states. So to ensure that we leverage this, you know, our model says or works around the, the philosophy of, all right, you know, you're a stronger lead institution, but you need to partner with the other stakeholders and, you know, bring in these other players that wouldn't have access to, to this, right? And what that all of a sudden does is creates equity for us, right, whether or not only in how we fund, but also, you know, how we bring in uh, women leadership, how we bring in other stakeholders, how do we connect government uh, to, to researchers and to data. And for us, so that's a big piece of equity. So connections and connectivity is a community 
practice of you know practice all of a sudden translates into equity but another thing you know a critical thing and i'm surprised it didn't come in our first discussion is when we think of data there are lots of trust issues we need to be honest right even within academics even within the experts but once you provide this this framework for sharing knowledge exchange connectivity you know there's this trust built so that already then translates into sustainability and sustainability is a big part of how uh, health is going to play out on the continent and i think one other piece that's you know really powerful for us from from the health perspective is again when you think of you know connecting that first conversation we had around data and you know the second conversation around connectivity there's this piece of endogenous knowledge and there's a lot of endogenous knowledge in Africa that's not pinned upon. And just to give you a very quick example. So I remember responding to Ebola in, in you know, Sierra Leone, Liberia and Guinea. And I remember, you know, there was this whole thing about isolation and stuff and, you know, having this academic conversation of how we're we going to do this X, Y, and Z. But all of a sudden, because we had this connectivity and we were on whether we you know, networked within networks of communities, you know, it was the endogenous knowledge that drove this because somebody from Sierra Leone said, hey, you don't need to do this. We already do this. We already have isolation centers for our women and children, you know, when they go through uh, measles or when they go through menstruation and stuff. So we literally, that was knowledge, that was data that existed that we could leverage on. So I think, you know, just, just to end, it's, you know, life transforming and for us and the end of implementation, it, you know, drives three things, equity, endogenous knowledge and trust. Wow. Uh, we, we have a question online, and Victor, I'm going to direct this question to you. Um, it comes to us from Daria uh, Tamareva. She notes and asks, how could we effectively implement data for the humanitarian sector? We, and then another question, um, uh, I'll, I'll, say, I'll, say, I'll say the second one with you, Honorable, which asks, uh, we lack digital skills. What can be done to rem remedy this situation? So, Victor, the first question for you is, how could we effectively implement data for the humanitarian sector? And then a question on digital skills and remedying that uh, for, for, for you, Honorable. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so how could we implement data for the humanitarian sector? Um, uh, so for, for us, um, we we one of the things that we you know come to discover is that um, the within the principles of you know uh, leaving no one behind, we we've come to realize the fact that um, the development sector straddled with, between the public sector and the private sector seems to be very much advanced uh, uh, as the private sector is but within the public sector space uh, there, there is there's a lot of capacity issue uh, and uh, and so our concern is how do we bridge this capacity issue that enables the public sector particularly coordinating with the development space in the private sector to respond you know uh, more effectively to you know humanitarian issues when and when they do break out uh, in Africa. And so we, we're looking at a couple of things, uh, particularly within the public sector space, to strengthen their capacity in responding uh, to, to humanitarian issues. Of course, when uh, COVID broke out, it has, of course, humanitarian you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, dimensions to it. And what did we do with a couple of countries across Africa? One is the fact that we did discover that infrastructure was a major, major challenge for the public sector in responding to issues uh, such as humanitarian challenges. Infrastructure such even as computing infrastructure that enables them to bring together all the key information and data sets uh, that enables them to make quick decisions. So we were working with a number of the presidential task forces on COVID-19. Uh, to, you know, uh, of course, bring in our private sector partners, looking at where infrastructure is needed for immediate deployment and where, you know, causing that partnership to occur. Second is the issue of uh, our, our capacity, knowledge and skill in using this infrastructure and data uh, to making the decisions that governments, you know, are needed to make at that point in time. And then we identify what are those capacity related issues and brought together a set of our partners who are helping to train public sector officials across Africa in identifying and using the type of data that is needed 
to support governments in making decisions. We have, you know, partners like Grid3 who was working with a number of health institutions, the uh, uh, the uh, the national statistical offices across Africa in a couple of countries to bring the sort of data sets that they need, both from the economic side, the health side, you know, just, you know, mashing these data sets together to provide analytics and insights to enable government to make a decision. The third area was the area of uh, the capacity around understanding sovereignty issues with respect to data. This data that is needed you know, for decision purposes are being collected from a set of people across various communities. We were opening the eyes of government to ensuring the fact that these people whose data is going to be collected and used must have a say in the way that data is being collected from them and in the way that that data uh, would eventually be used. And so we wanted to ensure that everyone whose data is being used must have a say, they have a right, uh, their rights as well must be protected. But more importantly also, we saw that a lot of folks from outside of Africa were all jumping into Africa, demanding for data from government, you know, using that data without recourse to certain principles, sovereignty principles uh, in those locations. And so we're opening the eyes of government and strengthening the capacity to manage this data set in terms of understanding that the first uh, issue has to do with ownership. Governments within those spaces where those data sets are being collected must exercise ownership uh, over such data. We also wanted to be sure that we're, we're, the, those data sets need to also be located within the confines of those countries. There were countries that were willing to work, but they insisted that the data sets must not leave the shores of their country. They must be used for the purposes for which they were collected for. And of course, the issues of privacy and protection, you know, how data moves from one country to the other, you know, even building the capacity of government in terms of governing that whole data space itself was a major issue. Governments across Africa, in most instances, the public sector institutions that handle these processes don't have real capacity within the issues of data governance. So we're also helping to build those capacities to ensure that the data sets that are going to be used are, you know, are, 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 are limited, you know, to, to, to the borders of that nation, but of course also are very much, you know, the people comply with the protection laws, the confidentiality issues uh, that that data brings upon all of us. Uh, so in a nutshell, the, uh, the humanitarian sector needs data. Uh, and critically, how do we help them is also making sure that the data that they need uh, can be available. It's accessible in formats that they can take and use this data for quick decision making. And so we, we are hoping that uh, one of the things that governments in Africa would really focus on is in data infrastructure that enables data systems from across various institutions to be connected together and to grant you know, better access to everyone, particularly within the government sector who needs to use this, this data uh, for policy and decision making. Uh, thank you. Honor, before you, before you jump in, um, are there questions in your, if, if you have questions in the room, please uh, line up and we'll make sure to get you honorable and then we'll have these two questions. Yes, please. Sorry. Oh. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just going to keep it short so you don't have to stand for too long. Um, basically, when it comes to education, it's it's a very simple process. We, we need to be able to work with civil society and the technical society to build the capacity and do these training programs. Members of parliament need to be able to, on our own, we can offer the training. We can give the training, but we can partner with civil society organization. And, and, and technical society to bring the skill sets to our constituents. So for example, I could put, to, I could put um, a quota from my constituency development fund towards acquisition of the skills and then run them as boot camps so that the local constituents are able to get some of these digital skills. So I think it's going to, and, and then that's just at the level of the member of parliament but government as a whole must begin to look at how it can also run these programs. In Ghana, for example, we have the Girls in ICT program, which focuses on girls in second cycle schools, takes uh, a, a, a basically a, a roadshow to the schools, trains them in basic uh, code writing and, 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 and hacking and ethical hacking and gives them some kind of digital skills. And so governments can be able to invest in those kinds of programs as well. But ultimately, the resource must come from private sector, civil society. We must be able to build those synergies and, and give those skills to the people. 
Thank you. Um, my name is Jarrell James. I founded something called the Internet Alliance, uh, and I've done a number of cryptography projects before this. I work in a deeply technical field on emerging technologies around cryptography for quite a while. And so I'd like to ask a question specifically around leverage. And as someone who is a, a devout Pan-Africanist, I do think uh, this is very relevant. When we talk about like Walter Rodney or Thomas Sankara, do we think that their values around African intellectualism, African like ingenuity, and valuing that as a resource is, do we feel that that is reflected in the way that African nations are, are leading their countries with development around data sharing? When uh, Victor spoke about not let letting data leave borders, um, I mean, in a lot of ways when we work in cryptography, it's like data can leave borders, but it can only be accessed by those who have direct um, cryptograph cryptographic key access to that data. And there is this idea that Africans are just supposed to share everything that they have for the sake of development, for the sake of checks, for the sake of you know investment from expat. Um, so my question is really around like community networks and all of this stuff is really great, but are we f is there ways and better approaches to leveraging data as an actual asset? Leveraging the fact that GSMA predicts the greatest boom and growth in internet uh, users is going to be Africa and is Africa year over year. So when someone comes in and builds telecommunications infrastructure and they choose not to go to a, a region that seems to be not profitable, well, do we feel that there's room there to say, well, if you want access to this data, we have leverage over you. Can we develop more? I just want to hear some thoughts on this. Because it seems like we're operating from a very, from like a very subservient position there. I love the question. I'm going to take the second one and we'll, we'll try to get both. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so my name is Emmanuel from Togo. So uh, mine is more like a contribution. Um, because recently I worked with APC and other organizations on a report regarding data protection on the continent. And what we noticed is that on the continent, we are leapfrogging. Like, um, we are collecting too many data. I mean, in our countries now, you see the telcos are collecting, the hospitals are collecting, everybody's collecting data. So the consequences in the future can be very huge with all the emerging technologies we are seeing today, like AI. So the consequences for the continent, we have to be careful. They will be very, very huge. And uh, it is important for us to develop our data protection laws on a human-based approach, human right-based approach, because most data protection laws on the continent today are not developed you know, on a human right-based approach. And by human rights principles, I mean the accountability. There are a lot of data breaches in Africa today, but who do we hold accountable? So there's that accountability. There's also the discrimination, equality, empowerment, and legality. Um, I know a lot of countries in Africa today are actually enacting data protection law for the sake of a check. So it's something that we have to actually also see that is it really necessary for us to collect this kind of data? Because we call it two main data, if I take, the voters, for example, in my country, they collect their biometric data, they take their picture, they take their 10 fingers, like they take all those data, but the government does not have any infrastructure locally to store those data. So those data are somewhere in Belgium with a private company. Nobody have access to those contracts to see the accountability level of those type of contracts. So three million voters have their data with a private company somewhere in the world. So those are some of the aspects that we have to also look at. I know in West Africa now, yeah, they are building a regional uh, data registry for countries like Benin, Burkina Faso, uh, Togo, where the World Bank has actually put in more than $300 million to actually um, build that registry. But the problem is that our government usually, because if I take the case of Togo, they took that check and before taking the check, the prerequisite was to vote a data protection law. They voted the law, but there's no agency to implement the law. So there's no need to have a law if we cannot implement it. So those are some of the things that we have to look at when we are actually uh, voting those laws. We have to be able to implement it. We have to be able to actually fight for our data. Right? We have to know who has access to it, to what level, can we correct it and all those kind of mechanisms? We have to put them in place before you know going for those check. Thank you. Honorable, if we could do this in a rapid fire, um, and I, I, I don't, I would be remiss if we didn't afford the folks who asked the questions to continue the discussion. So we'll continue the conversation.
probably have to walk outside to do it, but I, we would hap- we would be happy to do so. Honorable. I honestly wish these questions came like 30 minutes ago, and I agree with you. Africa doesn't know what we're sitting on. We're being exploited. Most times when we talk about exploitation in Africa, we think of just the, the, the natural resources, but data has been exploited big time. It's been exploited because the big demographics are sitting on the African continent, and we have leaders who just don't understand the whole, the whole economics of data, and, and it's a big problem. And I think that there's an awakening coming. And the point you just made, and, and this morning's parliamentary track, it was a point I made to the panel. I said to them, it appears as though we come to these platforms and there's a checkbox that countries need to tick. So we need to have data protection laws. We need to have cybersecurity legislation. We run back, we go past the legislation, and then we get good ratings by international organizations. What they don't do is then find out, Africa has some of the best legislation, but implementation is zero. So there should actually be a matrix of checking implementation of legislation that's been passed. Because for example, you have Egypt that has a data protection law, but there is zero implementation of data protection in Egypt. And so there is no value to the citizenry there. Nigeria had a data protection law and just just only three months ago set up a commission. Okay, so there are real issues here, but the international community is interested in saying, oh, this country has passed the data protection law, they're doing a great job. And because we want to please Western capitals, because of the corruption of African leaders, we're unable to actually deal with what is really requisite. But I think we're running out of time. We'll continue this conversation, but I think that we need a new generation of African leadership that knows that our data is critical and we need to hold it. With, with that, we are at time. I want to thank the panelists here for all of the conversation that you helped to drive us towards. Give the panelists a round of applause. For the folks who are online, thank you for joining. Uh, unfortunately, we, we, we've got to go, but we, we will continue the conversation, and we look forward to having you all join us at our booths. It's in the main event hall, uh, excuse me, in the main exhibition hall. You can find us at uh, ACIP. At org, dot org. We're next to the kimonos, apparently, so grab a kimono and talk with us. Uh, and Dr. Smith, did you want to say anything before we close? Well, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say quickly to the brother, um, because Pan-Africanism is about recognizing our humanity. The idea of a United States of Africa relates to your question, and I don't think it's as futuristic as it seems. Um, it's actually an idea that has been talked about from the OAU. So I think Walter Rodney's idea of Pan-Africanism is really Africans at the grassroots level. While we need the politicians, they have their responsibilities and roles, we cannot achieve this goal of a global Africa, of a United States of Africa without the mass mobility of, of the young people of grassroots people, and it's important to leverage the technologies that we have to move this social movement of a United States of Africa forward, and we can achieve it. Perfect ending, thank you.